As you all know, uh, pancreatitis is uh, generally a clinical diagnosis, but uh, radiologists play a major role in both the diagnosis as well as the detection of complications. The role of imaging studies is to confirm or exclude the diagnosis if there's uncertainty, to identify the cause if possible, and most importantly, to detect complications and stage the severity of the disease. In addition, it's important for us to guide interventional procedures, uh, as I will illustrate. On ultrasound, the pancreas with pancreatitis is hypochoic relative to liver and it increases in size. You may see areas of focal, areas of hypoechogenicity or hyperechogenicity. The hypoechogenicity is typically when there is fluid or inflammation, and there may be increased echogenicity if they're in the presence of hemorrhage. But most importantly is the detection of necrosis, which is best detected on contrast-enhanced CT. Here's an example. A slide on the left is a patient with a hypoechoic enlarged pancreas, and the slide on the right is a patient with interstitial edema due to pancreatitis with enlargement of the pancreas and some surrounding inflammation. CT is, again, the study of choice for acute pancreatitis. It's useful when there's an uncertain diagnosis and to evaluate suspected complications, and it is critical for the detection of necrosis. What are the CT features of pancreatitis. The CT features include an enlarged pancreas, indistinct pancreatic borders, peripancreatic inflammation and fluid, and importantly, to look for the presence of necrosis and hemorrhage. Here's an example of a patient with mild acute pancreatitis, where you can see the pancreas size is normal to mildly enlarged, but notice the presence of interstitial edema and surrounding peripancreatic inflammation and fluid. Another patient, this patient has more severe form of pancreatitis, and it's critical to diagnose this. This is a patient with pancreatic necrosis involving the body and tail of the pancreas. The etiologies of acute pancreatitis in the United States are most commonly due to biliary stone disease in women and alcohol, especially in men. Uh, other causes are as listed and in your handout. Here's a patient which uh, demonstrates gallstone pancreatitis. This is an example where you can actually see the gallstones on CT, as well as the peripancreatic inflammation and fluid. MR is playing an increasing role in the diagnosis of pancreatic disorders. You can perform MR cholangiography, which is a non-invasive evaluation of the bile ducts and pancreatic duct for stones and masses. The fluid from the bile and the gallbladder, as well as in the ducts, are bright on heavily T2-weighted images, and the techniques that we use include that of thick slab MRCP, or rare technique, as well as a thin slice T2, or a haste or single shot fast spin echo technique. Here's an example of such a technique. You can see this is a thick slab MRCP or rare, where you can see the uh, normal common bile duct, normal pancreatic duct, and some effacement of the duodenum due to the presence of pancreatitis. There's no evidence of any stones or duct dilatation. Here's a patient who demonstrates multiple small stones within the common bile duct uh, on the MRCP. Uh, this is the haste sequence or thin slice MR. This is also confirmed on the axial images where we nicely can see the presence of gallstones as well as the common bile duct stones. Other etiologies of pancreatitis include that of trauma. And for trauma, CT plays a critical role in the diagnosis of uh, pancreatic uh, injury. Here we can see the presence of some mild peripancreatic stranding, but what you need to look for is you need to look for the presence of a laceration, as illustrated here. And this is the typical location of a pancreatic laceration in a patient with trauma. And the prognosis uh, can be significantly worse in the setting of pancreatic injury. This is another patient with a, this patient was a seven-year-old child who got injured on a bicycle, and you can nicely demonstrate the presence of a pancreatic laceration. Uh, extending uh, through the body of the pancreas. Other etiologies for pancreatitis include that of ductal anomalies, and for that we're often doing MR, but you can also use thin section CT, but it's important to look for these abnormalities, the most common of which is pancreas divisum, which has been reported as often in 5 to 14 percent of the population, and it's due to a failure of the dorsal and ventral ducts to fuse. And it's believed to be associated with acute recurrent pancreatitis, although this is controversial, and generally it's due to drainage through the minor papilla being inadequate and causing pancreatitis. Here's an example of a thick slab MRCP where we can nicely see the presence of pancreas divisum with the two non-communicating parallel ducts. Another patient with pancreas divisum on the axial images, notice how the ducts are draining separately into the duodenum. 
Similar findings can be seen on CT examination, and quite frequently now we're noticing incidental pancreas divisum, where again you can see the two parallel ducts draining separately into the duodenum on this thin section uh, CT examination. There have been a number of different uh, staging systems uh, for pancreatitis. The most uh, widely used is that of Dr. Baltazar. And the reason it's important is because the CT staging and severity index have an excellent correlation with the risk of death and the development of local and systemic complications. I'm going to show you the staging system, although when we read a CT scan, we don't give it a specific stage. But it's important because, as I will illustrate, the morbidity and the mortality increases. So what do you look for? Basically. With increasing grades of severity, you can see it goes from a normal pancreas to that of focal and diffuse enlargement of the pancreas to greater number of fluid collections, where a single fluid collection, and two or more fluid collections. And again, they're given a score, as illustrated in your handout. But just as importantly, if not more importantly, is to detect the presence of ne necrosis. And he uh, graded necrosis into either 30%, 30 to 50%, or greater than 50%. And you can see the score increases significantly. But most importantly, the mortality and the morbidity increases significantly. So the scoring system itself isn't as critical, but detecting these findings are critical. So you can see here, if there's no fluid collections, the mortality and morbidity are relatively low. But what he found was, as the number of fluid collections increased, the mortality and the morbidity does increase. Similar finding, notice that when there's no necrosis, the morbidity and mortality is extremely low, but notice how the presence of necrosis increases the mortality and morbidity significantly. Although uh, now uh, the surgeons as well as the radiologists are better at detecting necrosis and patients are treated a lot more uh, rapidly, uh, decreasing this morbidity and mortality. So just looking at the severity index, a similar pattern is seen, where as the severity increases, the morbidity and the mortality increases. Now I'm going to discuss the different complications associated with that of acute pancreatitis. I've broken them down to, into uh, seven of them, the first of which is intra- and extra-pancreatic fluid collections. Fluid collections most commonly occur in the anterior perirenal space in the lesser sac, although the collections can dissect anywhere. They can dissect into the neck, the pleura, the mediastinum, and the groin. And serial studies can be helpful in demonstrating either resolution of these fluid collections or persistence as pseudocysts. This is one of the few plain film findings. This is actually a scout from a CT examination showing the colon cutoff sign where you see the presence of air within the colon and absence of air due to cutoff of, uh, due to spasm. Here's the same patient. You can see the patient has evidence of pancreatitis with enlargement and heterogeneous enhancement of the pancreas. But what you can also see is you can see dilatation of the transverse colon, but the inflammation extends to the descending colon, accounting for the colon cutoff sign. This is a patient who has a uh, more severe pancreatitis. You can see the presence of a large amount of fluid extending from the pancreas. On the coronal images, you can see nicely the, the pathway of the fluid with pancreatitis where it extends into the pelvis. Other complications that you should look for is that of pancreatic duct disruption or fistulas. Here's an example of a thick slab MRCP where you can see the normal common bowel duct and intrahepatic ducts. You can see a normal pancreatic duct, but notice the disrupted duct and the presence of a large pseudocyst. Patients with uh, pancreatitis can have pancreatic pleural fistulas, which can also be a result of trauma. It's felt due to posterior disruption of the pancreatic duct into the retroperitoneal space with the fistulous tract extending into the aortic or esophageal hiatus, and it can be, account for recurrent large pleural effusions in the setting of acute pancreatitis. About half of them resolve, but surgery may be required. This was a patient who presented with pancreatitis and had some respiratory symptoms. You can see, as illustrated by the yellow arrow, the presence of a left pleural effusion. You can also see that the fluid is extending from the abdomen into the chest. With the use of coronal uh, reformatted images, you can nicely see the presence of the fluid extending into the chest. You can also see in the image of the right the actual disruption in the pancreatic duct and the pancreatic pleural fistula. An ERCP was performed confirming this uh, diagnosis. Pancreatic necrosis is a result of uh, pancreatitis and is seen as a focal or diffuse non-enhanced pancreas, and that's why it's critical to administer intravenous contrast material if uh, you're suspecting pancreatic necrosis. As I've illustrated, there's a dramatic increase in the complications and the mortality associated with pancreatitis, and the accuracy of imaging and detecting and quantifying gland necrosis can be higher, sometimes two to three days after clinical onset, so a follow-up CT may be required, especially if patients aren't doing well. 
The accuracy of CT for necrosis is very high. It's about 80 to 90 percent, with the specificity approaching 100 percent when you have a large amount of non-enhanced tissue, greater than three centimeters, or greater than about a third of the gland. It's important to realize that there's secondary bacterial contamination in as many as a half of the patients, which can be a major cause of death, with a mortality of 67 percent if greater than 50 percent of the gland is involved. And it's important also to recognize that CT is not reliable in distinguishing infected from non-infected necrosis. And the distinction between sterile and infected necrosis is by fine needle aspiration. So if patients aren't doing well and they have the presence of necrosis, we'll uh, aspirate it. Here's an example. You can see the normal enhancing pancreas to the level of the pancreatic tail, where there's a large pancreatic fluid collection and the presence of necrosis. Here's another patient. This is a patient uh, who, on the unenhanced CT, you see this large fluid collection. You don't see any normal appearing pancreatic tissue. After the administration of contrast, again, you see no uh, enhancing uh, pancreatic tissue. And this is due to total necrosis of the pancreas, and this patient required surgical debridement uh, to remove the necrosis and uh, ended up dying uh, subsequently later on. This is a patient with infected pancreatic necrosis. When you see air within the uh, pancreas and uh, you see the presence of necrosis, you have to certainly suspect infection, with it, which this patient uh, ended up having. And uh, it's a uh, poor prognostic indicator, uh, generally requires surgery uh, to debreed the pancreas. I'm going to discuss uh, MR findings of necrosis. In fact, I'm going to uh, discuss a lot of uh, MR findings for uh, pancreatitis, but uh, it's important to recognize that CT is our mainstay for the diagnosis of pancreatitis, but I figured uh, uh, it, it's uh, useful to consider MR uh, in certain uh, instances, especially uh, in younger patients who are, uh, often have uh, repetitive CT examinations and uh, require a significant amount of uh, radiation. MR is helpful in the diagnosis for necrosis. The pancreas is seen as black on T2-weighted images and gadolinium-enhanced T1 fat-suppressed images. Here's an example of a patient with a pancreatic necrosis uh, who uh, has this uh, large uh, fluid uh, density area replacing the pancreas. Uh, notice on the MR, however, on the T1 fat suppressed after gadolinium, the pancreas is completely black. It's a lot easier to diagnose. Um, and on the T2-weighted image, we see a black pancreas. It's also important, however, to recognize that a lot of these patients are sick and uh, should not be in the uh, MR scanner uh, and often can't hold their breath, although uh, we are able to do uh, relatively short sequences and uh, able to uh, do a relatively quick MR examination, but they have to be able to hold their breath. Here's an example of a, showing a patient who uh, presented with abdominal pain, has this uh, a CT examination. There's low density in the pancreas. It's difficult to tell if this is due to the presence of necrosis. Is this due to a dilated duct? Is this due to pseudocyst? Is this due to uh, introductal papillary mucinous tumor? MR examination shows it's not due to a dilated duct or a pseudocyst. You can see the normal appearing pancreatic duct. Similar to the CT examination, you see lack of enhancement of a large portion of the pancreas. Some of the areas of our increased signal intensity, and this was due to hemorrhagic pancreatic necrosis. Another patient, uh, this patient uh, uh, also had abdominal pain but wasn't very sick, has this uh, low density area replacing the uh, pancreas. MR examination on a T1 weighted image, it's low signal intensity replacing the pancreas. T2 weighted image, it's bright, but there's uh, locules of dilated uh, ducts. This uh, we felt was due to uh, Introductal papillary mucinous tumor replacing the pancreas. This was confirmed on ERCP where there was a large filling defect and mucin was pouring out of the duct. Other complications of pancreatitis include that of pseudocysts. Pseudocysts are most commonly associated with chronic alcoholism and are due to extravasated secretions or communicating tract with the pancreatic duct, and they usually develop later after four to six weeks of pancreatitis. About half of them resolve without intervention, but they can obstruct the bile ducts or the bowel. They can bleed or become infected. They're on CT, they're seen as uh, loculated fluid collections with a fibrous wall, and it's important to look for this uh, wall. Uh, they tend to be round or oval with a thin or thick capsule, and the fluid tends to be of low density. If you start to see a high-density fluid greater than 40 to 50 Hounsfield units, you have to suspect complications such as intracystic hemorrhage. On MR, uh, pseudocysts are seen uh, best on T2-weighted images as well as contrast-enhanced T1 uh, spoiled gray echo images. And MRCP is more sensitive than that of ERCP because less than half of them fill with contrast at ERCP. However, ERCP often better depicts the communication with the pancreatic duct. Some people think that MR shows the internal consistency better than CT, which may help guide drainage with more complicated fluid collections, often being more difficult and sometimes not uh, being able to drain percutaneously but requiring surgery. <clears throat> 
Similar to necrosis, secondary infection cannot be diagnosed by cross-sectional imaging unless you see the presence of air or if the patient, uh, um, if you suspect that it's infected, you should aspirate the fluid collection, and if it's infected, you should percutaneously drain it. Here's an example of a patient with a multiple pseudocyst on the MR on the T2-8 image. It's bright, as you would expect, due to the presence of fluid. On the T1 post-contrast images, there's increased signal intensity, and this is due to the presence of hemorrhagic or protonaceous uh, material. Here's an example of another patient with a pancreatitis and a pseudocyst. The upper image is a post-GAD image. The lower image is a T2-weighted image. But notice how nicely the T2-weighted image shows the presence of internal debris within these pseudocysts. This is a, uh, some pe- uh, Dr. Balthazar, as well as other people, uh, feel that a large number of the pseudocysts are a result of necrosis, which either is detected or not detected. Here's such an example. You can see the normal enhancing pancreatic tail, the lack of enhancement of a large portion of the pancreatic body. And uh, over the course of several weeks, this developed into a pseudocyst, where you can see <laughs> the pancreas is replaced by the presence of a pseudocyst. Splenic involvement can often be seen with acute pancreatitis, and it's facilitated by the location of the pancreas in the splenic hilum. You can see subcapsular or parenchymal fluid collection, pseudocysts, abscesses, infarcts, and hemorrhage. Here's such an example where you can see a large fluid collection dissecting into the splenic bed. Another example, this patient actually has chronic pancreatitis with calcifications. You can see the presence of a small pseudocyst as well as a perisplenic fluid collection. Abscesses are an important complication of that of uh, pancreatitis. It occurs in 3% of the population. Like pseudocysts, it occurs four weeks after the onset of acute pancreatitis. And it's important to distinguish infected necrosis from abscess because of these findings. Infected necrosis tends to occur earlier in the first or second week, while abscesses occur typically in the fourth week. The mortality of infected necrosis is double that of abscesses. Infected necrosis tends to be mainly solid and may require surgery, while abscesses is usually liquefied and usually can be drained percutaneously. If patients are septic and they have persistent fluid collections, you have to suspect the presence of an abscess, and certainly the presence of gas, although not totally specific, should increase the likelihood of an abscess, and you should consider a fine needle aspiration whenever you suspect an abscess. Here's an example of a patient with a pancreatic abscess. The diagnosis is relatively easier with the presence of air as well as the enhancing rim to this fluid collection. This is another patient with a pancreatic abscess. Again, it looks like a pseudocyst, but the presence of air and the patient being febrile uh, makes you suspect that it's due to an abscess, which it was. Here's a patient with an MR examination. You can see the presence of air within this fluid collection. You can also see on the T2 coronal image the presence of the air as well as the presence of debris within the abscess. Venous thrombosis is a common complication of acute pancreatitis. It mainly involves the splenic vein due to the proximity to the body and tail of the pancreas, and it can extend into the portal vein and the superior mesenteric vein. Uh, you should look for collateral circulation in the splenic hilum, as well as enlargement of the short gastric and gastroepiplug veins to consider the diagnosis. Here's such an example. You can see the absence of the splenic vein, but notice the presence of these short gastric and gastroepiplug veins, which are enlarged, which should make you think of uh, splenic vein thrombosis. This is a patient with a T1 spoiled gray necco post-GAD image where you can see the presence of the splenic vein thrombus associated with pancreatitis. Another complication to consider is that of hemorrhage and pseudoaneurysms associated with acute pancreatitis. They're important to diagnose because uh, they can uh, lead to death. Uh, fortunately, massive life-threatening intra-abdominal hemorrhage is rare. It tends to occur two to three weeks after pancreatitis to as far as several years after pancreatitis. And it's felt due to erosion of the peripancreatic vessels with formation of a pseudoaneurysm and bleeding. This is an example on a CT image where you can see the pancreas, but you can see this high-density fluid collection due to the presence of hemorrhage. This is a patient who had a pancreatic hemorrhage, where on an MR examination, you can see the fluid is bright on a T1 fat suppressed image. But notice on the T2 weighted image, you can see this low signal intensity uh, surrounding rim due to the presence of hemosiderin, which is diagnostic of a hemorrhage. Pseudoaneurysms most commonly involve the splenic, as well as they can involve the gastroduodenal and pancreatic duodenal artery. They're also felt to be erosion of the vessel by activated enzymes, and they're best detected with IV helical uh, CT. Uh, Radiologists can play an important role in embolizing these, uh, and the use of uh, embolization and surgery has decreased the mortality significantly from 25 to 60% to 12%. Here's an example. This patient had an ERCP examination, was felt to have a pulsating mass um, at the examination, but this emphasizes why you don't want to just aspirate these. This is why you want to give IV contrast material, because if you were to do that, this is what would happen. 
With the use of IV contrast, the diagnosis is quite easy. You can see this large splenic artery uh, pseudoaneurysm. Coronal reformat shows the neck of the pseudoaneurysm. The angiogram as well was uh, performed. Subsequently, it was coiled, and the patient did well. It's important to always consider whenever you have pancreatitis the presence of mimickers of pancreatitis. Here's such an example. Is this due to a pseudocyst or a mucinous cystic neoplasm? In this case, it was due to a pseudocyst, the patient had pancreatitis. Is this pseudocyst or mucinous cystic neoplasm? This was due to tuberculosis. Is this due to a pseudocyst or a mucinous cystic neoplasm? This is a post-GAD MR. This is a T2-weighted image. This was due to a mucinous cystic neoplasm. Is this due to pancreatitis? This patient had a gallstone. He had some inflammation in the pancreatic tail. It was felt due to pancreatitis. They took out his gallbladder. Notice, however, six months later, the presumed pancreatitis grew. This was due to a neoplasm. And even with MR, there's difficulty in distinguishing focal pancreatitis from cancer. So at this point, you're probably wondering which way should you go. I just showed some scary examples. Well, the way I look at it is if you have a cystic mass in a patient with pancreatitis, it's most likely going to be a pseudocyst or an abscess. If you have a cystic mass in a patient without pancreatitis, you should consider other etiologies, such as a mucinous cystic neoplasm. And if you're uncertain, you might want to aspirate them. Similarly, patients who have unexplained pancreatitis, if they're older or they have no risk factors for pancreatitis, you must be vigilant for pancreatic cancer, and at a minimum, you should consider a short-term follow-up exam. In the last time remaining, I'm going to discuss that of chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis is due to irreversible morphologic and functional damage to the pancreas. About three-quarters of the time in the United States is due to alcoholism. It's important to recognize that both ERCP and uh, uh, clinical examinations, although gold standards, are imperfect. Clinical diagnosis is especially difficult when early or mild, and rarely a cystopathology or confirmation present. In addition, imaging studies are limited to detect these mild forms. What do we look for? We look for the presence of introductal calcifications, which is the most reliable CT finding seen in about half of the patients. We look for the presence of par parenchymal atrophy, although that also is variable. And we also look for a dilated pancreatic duct and secondary radicals, other features such as beating of the duct or a regular duct, although the duct can also be smooth. On ultrasound, we look for changes in the appearance of the pancreas, either the echogenicity and size, the presence of calcifications, duct dilatation, and pseudocyst. And it's important to look for a mixed echogenicity with hypococ and hypercoch foci due to the presence of inflammation, fibrosis, and calcifications. Plain film, the diagnosis if you see calcifications, it's quite easy. This is a patient with chronic pancreatitis. This is an ultrasound patient with chronic pancreatitis where we see an echogenic focus due to calcification involving the pancreas. On CT, the gland size can be variable. You can see dilatation of the pancreatic duct and secondary radicals. And as I've illustrated, you can see a variable appearance of the main pancreatic duct with calcifications in about half of them. In an older study, although it probably wouldn't be changed significantly with multi-detector helical CT, a dilated pancreatic duct was seen in about two-thirds. Atrophy or calcifications were seen in a half. But notice the normal pancreas was seen in as many as 7% of patients. This is a typical appearance of chronic pancreatitis where you can see a beaded duct in the presence of multiple calcifications involving the pancreas. MR can play a role in chronic pancreatitis, although it's less sensitive for calcifications. It may be more sensitive to detect early chronic pancreatitis prior to calcifications. On MR, normally the pancreas is bright on the T1 fat-suppressed image due to the presence of acinar proteins. With chronic pancreatitis, as well as with other causes, you see a low signal intensity gland, and you also see decrease in heterogeneous enhancement following contrast and delayed enhancement. Here's an example. Diagnosis is quite easy on the CT examination. You see multiple calcifications. In the presence of an MR, you don't see the calcifications as well, but what do you see? You see a diffusely low signal intensity pancreas. Normally, this is the brightest organ on the T1 fat suppressed image. Also, what you see is you see lack of enhancement. Normally, the pancreas is the most enhancing uh, organ in the abdomen. And notice on the delayed phase, you see delayed enhancement. You can also see the beating of the pancreatic duct. Using uh, MR on the T2-weighted image, you can see the dilated secondary radicals, analogous to that of an ERCP, and you could potentially spare somebody an ERCP examination. Similarly, on a thick slab rear MRCP, you can see the normal appearing common duct, but you can see these dilated secondary radicals as well as the presence of a pseudocyst. Here's a comparable image of another patient with chronic pancreatitis where you can see the beating of the duct and the presence of a pseudocyst. Here's the corresponding ERCP. This is a patient uh, with chronic pancreatitis. You can see the presence of a pancreatic duct stone nicely as well as the presence of a gallstone. 
This is a patient uh, who has a calcification on a CT examination. It's hard to appreciate the presence of chronic pancreatitis involving the pancreatic body and tail. Notice on the MR examination, on the MRCP, you see the normal appearing duodenum and the normal appearing common duct, but notice the dilated beaded duct involving the uh, pancreatic tail. How do you distinguish uh, chronic pancreatitis from uh, cancer? Um, as uh, uh, previously uh, demonstrated, it can be quite difficult. The risk of pancreatic cancer can increase uh, significantly from the general population. If you have focal and large pancreas and a dilated pancreatic duct, it could be a diagnostic challenge because there's a similar appearance due to cancer and chronic pancreatitis because they both have fibrosis and ductal obstruction. Generally, however, chronic pancreatitis is more likely with calcifications and no obstructing masses, while cancer is more likely with a mass at the site of obstruction and atrophy of the pancreas. So what features do you look for? These features favor chronic pancreatitis and a regular dilated pancreatic duct, the presence of dilated ducts and small pseudocysts within the mass, introductal or parenchymal calcifications, and relatively limited atrophy of the pancreas, as well as a gradual, not an abrupt narrowing of the dilated pancreatic duct or bile duct. Other features uh, that you can look for, these features favor cancer. If you have a high ratio of the duct caliber to that of the gland width, if you see the presence of a double duct sign of a dilated uh, and non-communicating pancreatic and combile duct, as well as a distended gallbladder, the imaging Corvazier sign. Here's an example of a patient at a CT scan, and you can see that there's a mildly dilated uh, pancreatic duct, but it's hard to appreciate the presence of a mass, despite it being a good uh, uh, thin section helical CT examination. MR examination on a T2 weighted image, you can see the dilated duct better, you can see the abrupt termination of the duct, and you can also see on the T1 fat suppressed image, if you remember, the bright, pancreas should be bright, we see a low signal intensity mass involving the uh, pancreas. And notice after contrast on the arterial phase, the pancreatic mass has a rim of enhancement, which enhances on the venous phase, and this was due to a small adenocarcinoma on the order of less than a centimeter, which was not contour deforming and explains why it was difficult to see on the CT examination. The last topic I want to discuss is that of groove pancreatitis, which is uh, a form of uh, segmental pancreatitis from repeated episodes of pancreatitis or an acute exacerbation of that of a chronic pancreatitis. Basically what happens is you develop inflammatory reaction and fluid which dissects into the groove between the duodenum and the head of the pancreas and it can mimic that of adenocarcinoma. It's often seen as a scar of the duodenal wall with stenosis as well as the presence of duodenal and pancreatic cysts, and as many as 50% of them develop duodenal stenosis or strictures of the common bowel duct. Here's such an example that was lent to me by a former fellow, uh, Dr. Lai. Uh, you can see the presence of a cyst. Uh, here's the pancreas, and you can see that the duodenum looks abnormal. Here's the MR examination of the pancreas. Uh, as I told you before, the T1 fat suppressed image, the pancreas is the brightest organ, and you can see it uh, nicely here. You can also see this presence of this low signal intensity abnormality between the duodenum and the pancreas. Notice on the T2 weighted image, this abnormality is bright because it contains fluid. Notice also the low signal intensity associated with it and the normal appearing duodenum. Notice after contrast material, again, the pancreas enhances uh, markedly. Uh, the duodenal mucosal enhances um, markedly, but this abnormality does not enhance on the arterial phase. Notice on a five-minute delayed image that this abnormality does enhance, and that's due to fibrotic uh, material with the exception of the uh, cystic component, and that's due to groove pancreatitis. So in summary, imaging studies play an important role in the diagnosis and complications of acute and chronic pancreatitis. CT will uh, remain the mainstay in the diagnosis, although MR is playing an increasing role in pancreatic imaging. Thank you. Next lecture will be a review uh, of the upper GI tract. I'll use some examples of uh, disease in the upper GI tract by taking a pattern approach. I know there's certainly been a decrease in the use of barium in several practices, but some people still do a lot of barium work. And the way I see these, even if you do one case a year, you have to do it. You have to do it right. So uh, it's a fund of knowledge that I think uh, requires a basic approach, particularly for junior people who aren't seeing a large volume. Uh, in this half hour, I certainly can't cover everything, but what I'd like to do is cover a little bit about what I call holes, bumps, and narrowings. I won't really cover dilatation, although there'll be some of dilatation in the next talk by Claire. And the way I like to uh, help folks think about the GI tract is that there's a limited number of ways in which the GI tract can respond to a pathologic process or insult. And therefore, no matter how complex the disease process is, you can certainly try to divide it into a simplistic pattern of asking yourself, is this a hole, a bump, a narrowing, or a dilatation?
Let's start with bumps. Bumps is basically a mass, and any time you see a mass, you want to ask yourself, is this something that's totally intraluminal? You look at it on fluoro multiple views, is it floating around like a bezoar, a foreign body, ingested matter? Or is it originating from the wall of the bowel? Is it mucosal or submucosal? Uh, or is it originating outside the GI tract, and is it extrinsic? And basically, the kind of things that will help you is, uh, is, it, is it floating around, intraluminal, and uh, think about a prototypical mucosal lesion. A prototypical mucosal lesion would be, let's say, an adenocarcinoma. And certainly when it's small, it may not be irregular, but most adenocarcinomas eventually become irregular. So a prototypical lesion is an adenocarcinoma is going to be very irregular. And since it's originating from the wall, the angle that it makes with the normal wall is a relatively acute angle. A submucosal lesion is also originating from the wall, so the angle that it makes is also either a right angle or an acute angle, but the intact overlying mucosa is intact, so it's going to look smooth, whereas something that's extrinsic will initially have an obtuse angle. Maybe the model you might want to think about as a rule of thumb would be a, a balloon. Take a make believe a balloon is the stomach, and you take a ping-pong ball and press it up against the balloon. The inside of the balloon will take initially an obtuse angle. Now, obviously, if you press that ping-pong ball up against the balloon, deep enough, that angle will become acute. So again, the point here is these are rules of thumb, and you want to use them with a measure of intelligence based on the anatomy of the lo and the location. So let's take a look at some examples. So here we have a uh, large intraluminal filling defect in the esophagus. It's very long. It's very smooth. You want to ask yourself, what's the clinical context? Certainly, it doesn't look geometric. It doesn't quite look like a hot dog. Certainly, I've seen hot dogs being swallowed or foreign bodies, but this is actually a fibrovascular polyp. Now, the point here is that certain entities, like fibrovascular polyp, can become very long and have a very narrow pedicle. And that pedicle is not visible on the upper GI, therefore you can't see the attachment to the wall. But you simply have to recognize that it is one of the causes of a very long, smooth filling defect. The differential considerations usually include lipoma. However, if you see the same large filling defect, but it comes very, very lobular and irregular, there's no debris fluid level, so it's not ingested debris, uh, this is not going to be a fibrovascular polyp, a duplication, or a lipoma. This is a carcinosarcoma, a malignancy with mixed features, and quite interestingly, even though these are fairly rigid tumors, the esophagus is very distensible, and it may seem quite surprising, but these patients can present with these masses typically being quite large, and they may have had some mild dysphagia that they tolerated for a while. Um, just to use, again, the conceptual approach, the example here is one of a patient who's had a Bill Roth II surgery. So to orient you, this is the gastric remnant, this is the afferent limb, and this is the efferent limb. And I think you can see that there's a filling defect in the gastric remnant. It's very common in patients who've had Bill Roth surgery or gastric surgery that have retained debris and foodstuffs and possibly to develop a bezoar. But this is not a bezoar, and you can actually kind of get the impression that some of these lines or parallel circular or semicircular lines, somewhat similar to an intussusception, and that's exactly what this is. So this is an intussusception of the efferent limb, and you can see some of those lines in the efferent limb as well. The efferent limb is intussuscepting into the gastric remnant. You can have four types of intussusception. This is the most common type, efferent limb into the gastric remnant, or it could go across the anastomosis into the afferent limb and vice versa. Afferent limb into the gastric remnant or across into the efferent limb. So this can be a cause of a gastric outlet obstruction. Mucosal. We said typical mucosal lesion, when it gets big enough, is irregular. Certainly if it's something is very small, you can have very, a lot of trouble and can't tell whether it's mucosal or submucosal. Uh, and it should have acute angles. Here's a single contrast upper GI. There's a mass along the lesser curvature of the stomach. If you follow the normal lesser curvature and see the angle that the mass makes with the contrast-filled lumen, it's a relatively acute angle. So it doesn't have to be acute everywhere, uh, but it's a relatively abrupt angle. And you can actually see that with uh, compression or the way this film is taken, you can see some surface features, maybe subtly, that there's some interlacing lines, and this is a villus adenocarcinoma of the stomach. This is the same diagnosis, a villus adenocarcinoma of the stomach doesn't usually present this large, but just to show you a more obvious example of contrast entering a very, very large mass, and uh, it would be unusual for an adenocarcinoma to have such a regular lace-like uh, appearance, even though this is very coarse, so it doesn't really fit for ulcerations, and this is more of the villus or frond-like appearance. The preferred term for the gross feature is frond-like appearance. The preferred term for the histologic feature is really villus. I prefer not to use the term villus for the gross feature. Um, now, if we bisect this double contrast upper GI of the stomach in half, uh, 
and you take a look at any one half, let's take a look at, uh, if you like, the upper half, there certainly is uh, a very abrupt change and you have a very irregular mass. And you could say the same thing for the lower half. So in the antrum of the stomach, or in the colon for that matter, or in the small bowel, when you have a mucosal lesion that's irregular with acute angles, but it grows circumferentially, that's the result of the apple core lesion. So there's overlap between our discussion of malignant strictures and mucosal lesions. And this is an adenocarcinoma of the stomach. What about the mu submucosal? We said submucosal masses are smooth, and that means there's an intact overlying mucosa, and the angle should be relatively acute because it's originating from the wall. The differential is quite varied. Here's just a list of some things that might occur in the GI tract and the upper GI tract. Spindle cell tumors, lipoma, lymphoma, metastatic disease, Kaposi sarcoma, carcinoid, various uh, congenital abnormalities, and uh, other things like hemorrhage or even intramural pseudocysts from pancreatitis, for example. So the differential is quite varied, but the message I want to leave you with is that uh, when you combine the imaging features with, one, the location of bowel that's involved, and two, the clinical presentation, you can actually tailor that differential to one or two most likely things. So, for example, if you're in the stomach, the most likely thing is a spindle cell tumor, a lyomyoma, lyomysarcoma, or a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. You take the exact same appearance and put it in the colon, the most likely tumor becomes a lipoma. You take the same thing and put it in the small bowel, it may be a carcinoid, maybe a lymphoma. So here's a cone down view from the mid-body of the stomach from a double contrast upper GI showing a classic smooth mass having the features of a submucosal lesion, right angles, and smooth intact overlying mucosa. And this is a lyomyoma. And uh, again, just to correlate with CT, uh, although we're not cutting right where it originates from the wall, it sort of looks like it's hanging out in the lumen, but here you can see that submucosal lesions can be characterized by cross-sectional imaging's imaging, because when you have a lipoma, it essentially is going to be fat density. Although liposarcomas do occur in the body, they're extremely rare in the GI tract. And so if you see a fatty mass, it essentially is a lipoma and a leave-me-alone lesion, unless it's getting big and causing symptoms due to intersusception or due to stretching overlying mucosa and causing erosion and therefore bleeding. So otherwise, it's a leave-me-alone lesion. What about extrinsic? Smooth, intact mucosa, classically obtuse angles, but certainly large lesions, as I explained, the angle could be acute. So, uh, for example, over here, there's a... Uh, Lateral view from a double contrast upper GI series. There's a large mass along the posterior wall of the stomach. Very hard to tell specifically if this is a very large submucosal lesion or is this something from the retroperitoneum, a primary retroperitoneal tumor uh, growing in. Uh, however, you look at the CT scan, it becomes obvious that this is just a simple cyst in the upper pole of the left kidney pushing on the stomach. So it's a differential, and sometimes we need cross-sectional imaging. Just to show you the same concept, but to go back up to the esophagus, here we have a smooth defect along the left wall of the esophagus, just at and above the level of the arch. You can see from the cross-sectional imaging that we're dealing with an aberrant right subclavian artery, which is uh, running posterior to the esophagus, and therefore causing an indentation on the posterior or posterior lateral wall. Uh, and then you'll get cases as similar to the one in the posterior wall where really it's very hard to tell. You have to just uh, try to use all the imaging features you can and cross-sectional imaging to help you. So here there's a large mass. There's certainly a padding or a mass effect on the greater curvature of the antrum. Well, what is it? Is it submucosal? Or is it extrinsic? Well, if it's extrinsic, maybe it's originating from the pancreas. There's certainly no mass effect on the duodenum. There's no mass effect on the second or third or fourth portions of the duodenum. So it becomes very hard to tell. And in fact, um, if you take a look at the, uh, at, at the CT, and uh, as we play the CT, you can see that there's an extremely large lobulated mass with some areas of calcification, some areas of necrosis. The stomach is so compressed that you essentially can't really find the stomach. And the message here is that when these masses get very big, it could be very hard to tell. You may need an angiogram to see whether their gastric vessels are being draped by the mass, suggesting that the mass is originating in the stomach, and sometimes you can't tell until you go to surgery. But gastrointestinal stromal tumors, which is what this is, uh, all the spindle cell tumors do have a propensity to grow in an exophytic fashion and mimic extrinsic lesions. So the take-home message is, when you see a very large mass originating from the stomach, even though it looks like it's something extrinsic pressing in, if you have no other explanation, it probably is uh, some sort of spindle cell tumor originating from the stomach. Uh, what about outpatching? So that covers masses. 
Well, there can be all kinds of outpouchings, ulcers, diverticula, various types, pulsion, traction, special types like intramural pseudodiverticular diverticulosis, pseudosaculations, uh, outpouchings of normal bowel around areas of inflammation like in Crohn's disease, or post-op herniations of mucosa at suture lines, things like that. Let's just show a few examples conceptually. Pharyngeal diverticular can occur anywhere from the tonsil of fossa to the tips of the piriform sinuses, little diverticula, and usually are asymptomatic and generally of no clinical significance. As opposed to the Zenker diverticulum, which is originating in the cervical esophagus at the level of the cricopharyngeus muscle, this is a frontal uh, view, and you can see as it gets large, it flops to one side here, flopping to the right, but if you looked at it in the lateral view, they always originate actually posteriorly at the level of the cricopharyngeus muscle where the oblique and transverse fibers cross in an area called Killian's dehiscence. And those can retain foodstuffs and cause halitosis, can cause dysphagia sometimes, and in fact can empty of their foodstuffs when the patient lies down and goes to sleep and give aspiration pneumonias, and they can be treated surgically with a pharyngectomy. Uh, pulsion diverticula are common. In fact, the most common diverticula in the esophagus would be a pulsion diverticula. It usually occurs. Um, uh, sometimes in association with a motility abnormality, as in this patient, you can see some tertiary waves and a pulsion diverticula. The pulsion diverticula typically have this meso mushroom shape rather than a pointy shape. Traction diverticula much less common, and they would be due to TB, radiation, some type of inflammatory process, and tend to have a more pointy shape. Um, this is uh, an unusual entity. It's a uh, intramural diverticulosis of the esophagus, you can see these small, subtle, little flask-shaped diverticula. They have this classic appearance of a very narrow neck that's hard to identify. So they look like little collections of contrast, probably in dilated glandular structures of the wall of the esophagus, in this case associated with an actual stricture. They can be focal. They can be diffuse. In uh, many patients, in some series, up to more than half of the patients may be associated with candida involving the esophagus. And there's controversy whether the candida comes first or is secondary due to stasis within these dilated glandular structures. Uh, diverticula elsewhere are common. Here's a couple of examples of a very common fundal diverticula. It always occurs uh, on the high, on the posterior wall of the cardio of the stomach. There's controversy whether it's acquired or congenital. Uh, they should be recognized by the endoscopist. Uh, theoretically, any diverticula can accidentally be entered by a scope, uh, which could be a dangerous situation. So even though they generally have no clinical significance, if you do know about one, you certainly should mention it. Um, in patients with hernias, hernias are also a form of outpouchings. Uh, the classic sliding hiatal hernia can sometimes have a parasophageal component. You can see an example of what would be a pure parasophageal. So when you're looking at these hernias, you want to try to identify whether the EG junction is below the diaphragm or whether it's up. If it's up, it would be a parasophageal component to a sliding hernia, which usually is of not the same, of great clinical significance, uh, as opposed to a pure parasophageal hernia, which has a greater tendency to strangulate and produce uh, chronic bleeding, anemia, and even acute symptoms. Sometimes greater, a lot of por uh, even a portion of the stomach in a sliding hernia may go up into the chest, and you get basically an intrathoracic stomach, basically an extreme variation on a sliding hernia. What about ulcers? Ulcers can take a variety of shapes. The niche of the ulcer can be seen, can be round or linear, various forms, collar button, giant ulcers, or very shallow erosions. A malignant ulcer is characterized by a mass. It appears intraluminal because you're essentially getting ulceration in a mass. Uh, the way to remember the signs for benign and malignant ulcers is a malignant ulcer is really ulceration in the malignancy. So first picture our previous discussion about mucosal lesions. You're going to have a mass. It's going to be irregular, have acute angles. Then it outgrows its blood supply, and then it ulcerates. So that's why when you catch it in profile, it appears intraluminal. Some of these other features are certainly less reliable. Carmen Kirkland complex is if you have a flat cancer uh, that's compressed. For example, if you use a compression device, think of it like a pizza pie folded on, in half. And you're looking at the ulceration and the edge of the pie being the mass. Whereas a benign ulcer lacks a mass and projects extraluminally, and that's because it's ulceration through the mucosa. So if you catch it in perfect profile, you expect it to be deep to the mucosa line. You can have edema or collar or mound, which can mimic a mass, but as opposed to a mass which is irregular, the edema collar is smooth, 
radiating folds, and the other signs are less reliable, smooth, peristalsis, or heels. Hampton's line is very reliable, but it's only seen in 1% of benign ulcers. It represents undermining of the ulcer. It looks like a thin line crossing the neck of the ulcer. Here's a few examples a benign ulcer. You can see when you catch these two different patients uh, in profile, the uh, ulcer projects extra luminally. Just let your eye create the expected mucosal line. The second feature is there's no mass. Well, here the barium is too dense to see through. You have to use compression or double contrast technique. Make sure you can see normal folds. If you can't see folds, then you can't see a mass. And there's no mass. And the third feature is that the folds are radiating right into the ulcer niche. Here's another nice example on double contrast, a non-fast view of radiating folds. It's very important to remember that radiating folds does not mean folds that radiate. Because even in malignancy, you can have an attempt at desmoplasia at healing, and you could start getting folds that pucker towards the mass. But the mass will prevent those radiating folds from reaching the niche. Whereas in a benign ulcer, there's nothing to stop those folds from reaching the niche. So if they reach the niche, it's specific, and that's when you use the term radiating folds. If they don't reach the niche, the fact that they appear radiate is less specific. So here there's an, what looks like a niche and radiating folds, so this should be benign, but this patient previously had an, had an ulcer, and that heal, that ulcer was extremely large, and sometimes when ulcers are very large, they heal, the crater endothelializes, and the patient essentially has no acute findings anymore. So this is a very big ulcer scar. Nothing about the imaging specific that will highly reliably tell you that it's a scar, but the patient will not be symptomatic, won't have tenderness. Sometimes the edema can be prominent and have indeterminate features. You see radiating folds, but the folds don't really radiate up to the niche. And does the ulcer, where do you draw the line? So it's very hard to know where to draw the line, and there's a big either mass or mound of edema. So some of the features contradict each other, and that's an indeterminate ulcer. Certainly, all ulcers get scope, but if you're doing an upper GI, and certainly in the days when we would rely on these signs, we would divide these patients into benign, which might be followed up with healing to healing with another upper GI versus indeterminate and malignant, which would immediately be scoped and biopsied. I think nowadays everybody obviously will scope and biopsy every newly diagnosed gastric ulcer. Here's a patient with uh, peptic disease, has had a gastrojejunostomy, has a post bulbar ulcer or scarring. I mean, this may actually be an ulcer if the patient is symptomatic, or this could actually be healing and sort of an outpouching or pseudodiverticulum in an area of scarring in the patients who's had post bulbar and bulbar disease. As opposed to this patient, where there's a very large active ulcer, this very, very large collection. Uh, is what we call a giant ulcer. The term giant isn't just totally subjective. In the literature, it has some definition. People use either two and a half or three centimeters to use the term giant ulcer, and the reason they do that is because the surgery literature and GI literature indicate that patients with ulcers of that size tend to have more bleeding that may require surgery, and if they don't have surgery, when they heal, they're more likely to have a, uh, an obstruction due to scarring. Here's an example of a perforated duodenal ulcer. It's actually hard to identify the anatomy and where this is a pylorus. There's a lot of contrast. It's hard to tell if it's extraluminal, but this is certainly extraluminal. And on the uh, CT scan, there was a lot of fluid, and it was actually extraluminal gas. So perforated duodenal ulcer. Um, in patients who have peptic disease, and this doesn't fit into our pattern of a niche, but just for completeness sake to show you some other manifestations, sometimes you get intramural fistulas. And those intramural fistulas then give appearance as though there's more than one pylorus. So if you sort of make believe you're the barium driving on the road, you have trouble figuring out there's a fork in the road, and which way do you go? And the terms used for this are double pylorus commonly. This is the only example I have that's endoscopically confirmed of two fistulas. So one of these represents the normal pylorus, and the other two represent fistulas, intramural fistulas. A true, a true tri triple pylorus is the eponym. This is a patient who's also had a partial gastrectomy and a Billroth II surgery. You can see three collections of contrast. These are marginal ulcers. When you have a patient who's had surgery, you'd like to know how long ago the surgery was and what the surgery was for. Generally, patients with marginal ulcers have, had, uh, been, uh, have been operated on for uh, peptic disease, usually within several years, within one to three years of the surgery. Certainly, if you have somebody who's been operated on for malignant disease or for a gastric ulcer that was benign, those patients have a predisposition to develop carcinoma, particularly 10 years or more out. And you want to think about cancer in that, in that population if you're doing somebody who has had surgery 10 years or more 
prior. And this is a magnified uh, cone down view uh, from the uh, single contrast upper GI of the antrum. Here's the pylorus, here's the base of the bulb to orient you. These are the gastric folds, and you can see several ring like structures, some which do not have contrast centrally, and some which do. So these are superficial ulcers. Now, we t use the typical term or aphthous ulcer with a superficial ulcer where you can see an umbilicated pattern, but you're not always going to get barium in every little umbilication. So if some of them are umbilicated, that would be the clue. Sometimes, uh, depending on the clinical context, you might wonder in terms of differential diagnostic considerations of these metastatic foci with ulceration. Certainly, if you have a patient with melanoma, Kaposi sarcoma, patient with AIDS, you might think about that. But certainly when it's limited just to the stomach and the antrum, you're more likely dealing with either a superficial gastritis, which is nonspecific. You certainly want to think about other specific causes like Crohn's disease that might give aphthous ulcers in the stomach and look for disease in the small bowel. This, these ulcers are seen both on Fosten and Profile. In Profile, you can see there's a very long ulcer, a shallow, long ulcer. Some contrast is being caught in the ulcer here on FOS. Here's another one. The more you look, the more you see. And these are very characteristic of cytomegalovirus esophagitis. Very few things give these very, very long ulcers. Most of these patients are immunocompromised, often but not exclusively AIDS patients. And uh, sometimes the ulcerations are not so apparent. There's a combination of ulcer and lobulated mass. So just for completeness sake, again, getting back to the mass concept and malignant ulcers, uh, we have circumferential tumor. But here, much of a, a bit unusual, instead of involving the antrum, we do have a circumferential, almost apical appearance in the midbody of the stomach. Because the stomach is a large bore organ, it's very unusual to see that particular pattern. It's more common to see that pattern in the antrum. Here's just a gross view to show you what these ulcerated masses look like, sometimes in association with other polyps and other masses in the stomach. And uh, this would be the more common apple core analog in the upper GI tract I showed you before on the double contrast study with the acute angles of a circumferential mass. Okay, and let's uh, now talk a little bit about strictures in the remaining time. Uh, strictures typically are benign. Strictures are tapered, smooth, and centric, whereas malignant will have an acute angle representing the overhanging edge of tumor, be irregular and eccentric. But again, that's just a rule of thumb. Classic benign stricture being smooth due to the previous surgery in the proximal esophagus. Classic small hiatal hernia with a small, very focal stricture. And certainly uh, in this patient who may or may not have had refluxes, any newly diagnosed stricture really should be scoped and biopsied to make sure there's no cancer. When you're doing a study, if you see a newly diagnosed stricture, if it's very tight, you don't want to give a barium pill. If it's not very tight and you're not sure, you might want to give a pill to see if it's obstructive to the pill. When it is obstructive to the pill, it more commonly is in the explanation for the patient's dysphagia. Here's a patient with a small hiatal hernia, a stricture, and this is all reflux. I'd like to remind you that when you're doing studies and you do demonstrate reflux, it's important or valuable to mention whether that reflux was spontaneous or induced. Spontaneous reflux has a much greater significance. And in fact, the most important thing is to stop afterwards and watch how, see how quickly it clears. Because rapid clearing, even in a gross reflux, is associated with good clinical follow-up and, and management, whereas patients who have very, very slow clearance have the acid of the stomach chronically bathing the esophagus, uh, and that correlates to 24-hour pH monitoring studies. Those patients are more likely to get rip-roaring esophagitis and possibly require surgery. An interesting pattern is this transverse folds of feline esophagus. It's commonly seen as a normal variant. It's transient and thought to represent contraction of the muscularis mucosa, but if it's a fixed finding and doesn't go away, then it's a sign of esophagitis, and in this case associated with some scarring, synechia meaning bridging tissue that the endoscopist sees like a little step ladder bridging the wall, a tapered stricture, and a small sliding hiatal hernia. And these masses and the, uh, again, narrowing of the esophagus or a stricture, you know, malignant stricture, but on a CT scan, you don't really appreciate those features of tapered, but you can certainly see that the esophageal lumen is compromised, there's a big mass in it, and in fact, you can actually see a little contrast getting into an ulceration in the mass. It's a patient with, therefore, essentially malignant stricture. And just to show you some of the unusual complications, here's a patient with an esophageal mass who developed an esophageal bronchial fistula to the left main bronchus. This can occur spontaneously. More commonly, these fistulas occur after the patient has had, started getting radiation and palliative 
treatment. In this case, that particular fistula was then treated uh, or palliated with a stent, which on the contrast study prevents filling of the fistula, which previously was demonstrated. And here a double contrast study showing again another annular lesion, very irregular and ulcerated. In the antrum of the stomach and the CT analog of that, marked wall thickening to over one centimeter with an abrupt or acute angle or acute edge. Okay, so in conclusion, those were some, I think, examples to give you just an overall view that we can apply to both the small bowel, to the colon, uh, but using the upper GI tract to show you examples of holes, bumps, narrowings, and dilatation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm glad that uh, Abe has sort of broken the ice and got you out of culture shock so that you're ready to see some more conventional contrast images instead of that CTMR stuff that you saw all morning. Um, the goals of this talk are to review the basic things you should know about small bowel disease, briefly how to do the exam, more importantly how to look at it logically, and then we'll look at some normal and abnormal findings, mainly on barium work. But remember that you can apply the essentials to however you look at the small bowel, whether it's on CT or on MR or on enterocolysis. The lucky thing is that small bowel diseases are relatively rare, and we wind in, up investigating it when there are true lab values that indicate small bowel disease, especially malabsorption, when the patients have symptoms of bowel obstruction, when there's known Crohn's disease or GI bleeding source unknown. And we're going to take a few minutes just to remind you what the small bowel does in case someone, either your referring physician or if you find yourself in front of an examiner um, and they ask you about the small bowel, you may be able to remember a little bit. Malabsorption really is decreased absorption of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, minerals, and those fat-soluble vitamins, especially A, D, E, and K. And patients who have small bowel malabsorption have the signs and symptoms that just just reflect the nutrient malabsorption, they'll have weight loss, they'll have edema from the hypoalbuminemia, and the various vitamin deficiencies that you remember. Malabsorption can really be cut down into three individual phases. Maldigestion, that is what happens in the stomach and the gut. Malabsorption, what happens to the small bowel as it gets faced with the food. And finally, malassimilation, how those nutrients get transported. The first phase, or maldigestion, is really a defect in the intraluminal phase. And if you remember, pancreatic enzymes get put into the gut. The um, food has to get absorbed. And basically, it is done best if there is a um, slightly basic medium. Um, if there are bile salts that are abnormal, you won't have all of those things within the gastric and small bile lumen to let you digest the food. Malabsorption is when there is an actual problem in the mucosal phase, when the villi of the small bowel are abnormal for a variety of diseases, some of which are listed up there. So um, maldigestion is what happens in the lumen. Malabsorption is really what happens within the small bowel wall. And once those um, nutrients get worked on and absorbed through the wall, you have to transport them someplace. So if patients have trouble with either the lymphatic or lipoprotein disorders, eventually the nutrients will not get absorbed correctly. And your gastroenterologist will come down and dazzle you with a variety of tests that they can do. And the only ones that I remember is I ask them, well, what about the albumin and what about the protein? Because if those tests, albumin and protein, are normal, there is probably not really true malabsorption. And the other test that I know about, because my gastroenterology friends have clued me in, is the d xylose test, which is the most reliable of all their tests for indicating malabsorption. d xylose is a five-carbon sugar, and it gets um, taken up through the small bowel wall, and it does not get acted on by anything else. So if their d xylose test is abnormal, there's a 95% chance that there is true small bowel abnormality. Some of the other tests they can do, fecal fat, the shilling tests, and some of these other ones will, will measure different things, but the d xylose test is the best one. 
finally, they can go down and aspirate fluid for culture, or they can actually send down a little um, suction capsule and take a piece of the small bowel. What can we do? Now that, that you've heard the variety of tests, what actually can we do? Well, we can do a contrast examination of the small bowel, and what we like to do is what's called a dedicated small bowel series. We have the patient ingest a large quantity of barium, two cups of barium and two cups of water, and then with very quick timing, we give them effervescent granules and we actively palpate and watch the bowel. Whether you do that examination, an enterocolysis, CT, MR, it doesn't matter. What your job is to do is to try to look at the small bowel the best you can. Currently, there is a lot of talk about the video capsule endoscopy, and if you've seen in the uh, relatively new radiology journal, it shows things wonderfully. Yes, it does because it actually sends a little capsule down, and they can take pictures of the small bowel. We're going to dispense with that one since, uh, as radiologists, we have little to do with this. The patient swallows a capsule. It will go through the uh, bowel. It is weighted so that it goes head first. And there is a little, a little video transmitter that, in fact, takes pictures um, as the capsule is going through the small bowel. But there's a strobe light that illuminates the bowel once every second. So eventually, the gastroenterologist winds up looking at an eight-hour recording of the inside of the bowel. I've actually reviewed some of them with our gastroenterologists, and I don't think it's ready for prime time because it takes them a long time to review it. One of the things you would like to do is to make sure there are no strictures. And this is a patient who, in fact, had Crohn's disease. The video capsule is stuck above an area of stricturing in Crohn's. So um, one thing that you should do is just make sure, if you can, that um, there are no strictures before you send the video capsule down. This is the second test that I'd like to dispense with. Many of your surgical colleagues may ask you to examine the small bowel with water-soluble contrast material. They have patients who may have obstructions and they don't want the barium to hang around in there. The answer is no. We don't use water-soluble gastrographin because it is hypertonic. It will increase third spacing, and the contrast material essentially disappears in front of your eyes. So those are the two tests that we just uh, don't get involved with nowadays. Well, if you do a contrast examination, what does the small bowel look like? It depends on your technique. So you should become familiar with how you examine the small bowel and what the, uh, it looks like. In the jejunum, the jejunum is about three centimeters in diameter and the folds are about two to three millimeters. The ileum is slightly more narrow with smaller folds. The, this and the next couple of slides have been reproduced with permission from Gore and Levine's text of uh, gastrointestinal radiology. The chapter was written by Dr. Hans Herlinger, and it shows you a beautiful double contrast examination of the small bowel. And as you look a little closer, notice that the folds appear a little wide, perhaps four or five millimeters, but the next um, slide shows you that when it is distended, that same fold can look different. So it behooves you to become familiar with what the small bowel will look like on your standard exam. As I said, we wind up giving large quantities of barium and we actively palpate. This is about a 15-minute film, and if they drink quickly, you will be able to opacify from the stomach to the colon. After effervescent granules, um, the, the fluoroscopist will push, will palpate, will move things around, and re really become intimately involved in the examination. This is just an example that shows our standard, and although it may be hard to see, there are fine nodules along the edge of this small bowel in a patient with Crohn's disease. So get used to how you examine, get comfortable with the way that you like. Whether you do CT, enterography, or MR, whatever, just be familiar with what normal looks like. Be that as it may, Pick a logical plan. Find out how you're going to look at these yards and yards and yards of small bowel. We go by location, by caliber, by fold thickness. Are there any nodules? Are there any ulcerations? Are there mesenteric changes? And what is the distribution? So location, location, location. Where does the small bowel live? Is it displaced? Is it herniated? And this is just an example of a relatively asymptomatic individual who has non-rotation of the small bowel, 
All of the small bowel is on the right. All of the colon is on the left. And if you recall from your embryology, there is a physiologic herniation and the bowel turns and then rotates back into the abdomen. At any point in that twisting and turning, you can get a degree of malrotation. What I remember with non-rotation is that LADS bands are thick bands that can cross from the right lower quadrant over to the cecum. So patients may be symptomatic. When there is a gross um, obvious external herniation, things are easy to see. However, in this patient who was a young woman, she had chronic abdominal pain, had been from doctor to doctor, and was actually written off as it all being in her mind, had a small bowel follow-through study, and if you notice, these loops are high in the left upper quadrant, and they stayed like that during uh, fluoroscopy. Uh, the patient went to the operating room because we had convinced the surgeon that this was an internal hernia, and in fact, she did have a left paraduodenal hernia. And this is reproduced with permission from the Journal of Gastroenterology in 1999. Our surgeons were shocked that we could see a uh, small bowel hernia on a contrast exam. CT affords a much better look at where things live. And if you notice, there are some contrast-filled distended loops here, some fluid-filled distended loops here, but I put your eye to that swirl pattern in the mesentery, and those of you who look at CT know that that whirlwind tornado pattern is always abnormal, and this patient went to the operating room and had a closed-loop obstruction. These are loops that are downstream. It shows that there is some mesenteric and vascular engorgement, but she did not have gangrene um, at her surgery. This is just a different example of kind of what malrotation can look like, malpositioning. The bowel is separated, um, the duodenal sweep it is widened, and these small bowel loops are not living where they're supposed to. There's some other soft tissue fullness. And what I show you is an ancient CT, and I marvel at we got anything right in uh, the early 80s. And if you notice, there is uh, too much tissue in the periaortic area in this patient who has uh, lymphoma. When you go, have, once you have location set up, look at the caliber. Is the bowel too wide or is it too narrow? If it's too wide, is the whole thing too wide? Or is it just locally too wide? Are there any ulcerations or are there any diverticula? And this patient came in with uh, symptoms of steatorrhea, kind of dyspepsia. She really wasn't fearing too well. And if you notice, there are distended small bowel loops throughout the entire abdomen. And we did give her some oral contrast material, again, showing you the small bowel distension. But if you notice, the folds are a little thick and they are very close together. The bowel in the residence, have heard me say it many times, can only do two things. It can either get obstructed or it can fall asleep. And if you think about the diseases that affect the small bowel, scleroderma is a perfect one. And when you look at her hands, you can see that she has soft tissue calcifications and some atrophy in her fingers. Remember that scleroderma will first be seen in the esophagus. So by the time you get changes in the small bowel, they have already had disease that could have been detectable in the esophagus. This is a patient who has acute abdominal pain, and it just shows you a completely obstructing band in the proximal small bowel. The end of this contrast column is very uh, tapered, and uh, the patient went and had a band released. And this is a traditional small bowel follow-through. Shows you that there is a zone of transition. So between the distended and non-distended bowel, we try to go in, characterize, and localize the zone of transition which you also do on CT or MR. And another sort of too wide small bowel is this patient, and as Abe said before, there are multiple diverticula in the small bowel, some of which have a little bit of food within it, and these people usually have trouble with um, B12 deficiency because the bacterial stasis, the bacteria within the small bowel, will compete for vitamin B12. So. Um, in the terminal small bowel, this is very close to the terminal ilium. If you notice, there is a branching pattern with a diverticulum. Remember, remember Meckel's diverticula, the rule of twos, two inches to two feet from the ileocecal valve. There are two types of mucosa within it, either pancreatic or gastric. And this patient, in fact, had an island of gastric mucosa, and there was a positive Meckel scan.
Here's another patient that has an area of small bowel that is too wide, but it is very localized. There is aneurysmal dilatation, and it is tough to see. You'll just have to decide for yourself that this wall is, in fact, too thick. And this is a patient who has lymphoma. Some of the uh, other tumors, leiomyosarcomas, can give this exoenteric pattern. And again, the CT scan just shows that the wall is completely infiltrated and excavated from within. So we're going to leave the too wide, and now we're going to go to the too narrow. And if you notice, this is a double contrast lower GI that shows you the typical um, irregular ulcerated narrowing in Crohn's disease, and that's a very common disease in our practice. This is the patient I showed you before, has irregular contours with nodular um, folds along the edges of the small bowel. There are some superficial ulcerations. Crohn's disease, the next word out of your mouth should be lymphoma because they can look exactly alike. And in this day and age with immunocompromised patients, we found that CMV, enterocolitis, can look exactly the same. And the last one you should think about is Yersinia enterocolitis, which is just a self-limiting enteritis. This is a patient who had done a lot of traveling, lived in the Far East for a while, and if you notice, there is a long stricture in the proximal small bowel. The duodenum is not so healthy as well. In, in this country, I'd probably think about Crohn's disease, although it's a little bit unusual, but remember, parasitic infections can occur. The parasites will invade the small bowel wall, set up housekeeping and basically get uh, fibrosis of the small bowel. And this was a patient who had strong aloides. Other proximal small bowel strictures, you can always think of radiation. This is a pretty long segment, but radiation could be one thing. People who have ischemia can heal to fibrosis would be another thing I would think about. If I gave you the clinical history for this, everybody would know, so I won't. If you look, there are some areas where the small bowel is definitely abnormal. The folds are destroyed. They have that, quote, toothpaste look to it. The lumen is narrowed. And if I tell you that this patient had a bone marrow transplant, everybody would talk about graft-versus-host disease, where the immunologically competent cells see the host as uh, foreign, and, in, and it involves the GI tract, the liver, and the skin. Other um, differential could probably include some kind of infectious enteritis. It would be pretty widespread to be ischemia or radiation, although that can be another consideration. And this is just a short ischemic stricture. Remember that uh, radiation and ischemia are on the same idea. It is small vessel disease and can heal with the stricture. So now we're going to go on to fold thickness. Look at the folds. Are they regularly thickened? Are they irregularly thickened? CT doesn't help me make that differential. I may not be sophisticated enough, but all I see is that the wall and the folds are too thick. When you look at a contrast examination, isolate one fold for yourself and try to follow it. Decide, is it smooth, regularly thickened, or if it's irregularly thickened? And I could convince myself that these are smooth folds. Whenever they are smooth, you should think about bland water in there. It's water, it's blood, it's hemorrhage, it's something other than cells. And this patient had um, a vasculitis, and this was just bowel wall edema. If the patient had been on anticoagulation, as this patient had, you can get smooth fold thickening, and this patient had symptoms of obstruction. But if the folds are regular, think just about water. This is a patient, it may be kind of tough, um, this is a patient that appears to have fold thickening, and it almost looks nodular, but you have to isolate a fold so that you can follow it completely sideways, and then you can convince yourself that there are no lumps and bumps in there. And for those of you who have noticed, they have an increased um, soft tissue fullness up here. There's a big spleen, and the patient, in fact, has cirrhosis, and the folds are thick based on hypoalbuminemia. <clears throat> fold thickening is also apparent in one other disease that helps 
Um, you know about it if you consider the distribution of the folds. If you notice, these folds are thick. They are regularly thickened, but there are a lot of folds down here in the ilium, and there are few folds up in the jejunum. It's the reversal of the fold pattern. Um, the uh, jeju the ilium looks like the jejunum, the jejunum looks like the duodenum, and the duodenum usually looks terrible. And the disease, as you've all figured out already, is celiac disease. This is a second patient with the same thing. Celiac disease is really based on injury related to the gliadin fraction in gluten. For people who are sensitive to it, you will get villus atrophy. All of the folds in the small bowel, we become edematous. When the patients stay off, um, any of the offending agents, when they go on a gluten-free diet, the villi will come back. Why should you know about celiac disease? One reason is that it is thought to be a pre-malignant disease. The patients have to be screened for both lymphoma or for adenocarcinoma. I'm going to switch gears a little. I hope all of you are convinced that these folds are too big, but if you look at them, they are not regularly thickened, they are wild, irregularly thickened, and are starting to have a nodular component to them. Leave the blood, the water, the fluid category, and go into cells. Start thinking about amyloid, start thinking about lymphoma, start thinking about eosinophilic enteritis, something that is going to pack those uh, walls with a lumpy, bumpy kind of contour, and this patient had lymphangiectasia, and the second patient who also has a very nodular contour to the folds. You have to find a fold and look at it. This patient had amyloid. So once you leave that fairly regular um, pattern, leave blood, leave water alone, and start to go to cells. Nodular folds lead into the, second, the next category of nodules. Are there any true nodules there? If there are, are they teeny tiny nodules? Are they small? Are they large? Do they have ulcerations within it? And it will, that pattern analysis will help you. I hope I can convince you that there are a bunch of tiny little uniform nodules in this uh, duodenum. This is what we term a lymphofollicular pattern, and if you remember, we used to refer to it as nodular lymphoid hyperplasia, which is really a pathologic diagnosis. This lymphofollicular pattern is fairly typical. All the nodules are tiny together. It is seen very commonly in giardiasis, which is what this patient had, although some of the other diseases like hypogamma globulinemia will give you a lymphofollicular pattern, and you always have to remember about lymphoma. This patient has larger nodules. If you look, they involve much of the small bowel and colon, and this patient, in fact, has lymphoma. These are no longer nodules, in my opinion. You come right out and say there are focal masses within the small bowel. There are several of them. And for those of you who are eagle-eyed, you've seen that there are a few intussusceptions. And remember that in adults, whenever you see an intussusception, there must be a lead point. These are um, polyps from poots jaeger syndrome. I suggest that you remember for yourself some of the syndromes. Remember that poots jaegers are hamartomas. Familial polyposis and Gardner's um, syndrome can have adenomas, although there are several other diseases, Cowden's disease where there are hamartomas, and Canada Cronkite syndrome where there are inflammatory polyps. But be that as it may, when you see a polyp in the small bowel, remember to look for an intussusception, and this pedunculated lipoma is just starting to pull the bowel within it. All of you are familiar with that double target sign where you can see some mesenteric fat being trapped. And then when you see it sideways on CT, that's that kidney shadow. And clearly you can see that there is mesentery within it. There's a second one here. Remember, for an adult, there must be a lead point. Filling defects are usually round when they're real, when they're elliptical and bizarre shaped start to worry about them. This patient loved to eat watermelon pits, and we chased those down for a little while. And in this age of cost consciousness, you know, we try to do our best. So this patient had a small bowel follow through, and the ascariasis in the terminal ileum also got a small bowel follow through with barium in the digestive tract here. So we're doing our part to try and uh, save costs. We're going to go to ulcerations. Are they superficial? Are they deep? Are they exoenteric? And this is a typical target lesion, a bullseye lesion with a mass. 
with an ulceration within it, as, been, as has been described before. Think about metastatic disease, the three kinds, breast melanoma and Kaposi sarcoma, and this was breast cancer. And Abe showed a few apple core lesions, and this, in fact, is uh, not an adenocarcinoma. It was a plasma cytoma in the proximal small bowel in somebody with myeloma, but it could very well be a typical adenocarcinoma. Remember, in the proximal small bowel, it's adenocarcinoma. More distally, it's lymphoma. Mesenteric changes. What about the mesentery? You have to just infer the state of the mesentery on a contrast exam, but remember that CT will show you the mesentery very well. Decide for yourself, is there a mass effect? Which side is it on? Is there any kind of desmoplastic response that you could figure out? As you take your eye down, you see that the small bowel is all normal in caliber until you get to an aneurysmally dilated small bowel loop. And you know that between here and here is thick wall, probably tumor, and this is lymphoma, although leiomyosarcoma can give a similar appearance. This patient has a long segment narrowing in the terminal small bowel with some radiating collections going sideways. You don't have any trouble identifying this as Crohn's disease. You have less trouble when you see the misty mesentery and the inflammatory changes around the bowel loop on CT. When you say lymphoma, when you say Crohn's, the next word should be lymphoma because they can look exactly alike. There are some mesenteric changes in this patient a little higher up. He complained of marked abdominal pain and had an increased white count, and the patient had some small bowel diverticula, and this was a perforated jejunal diverticulum, and the patient went to the operating room. Finally, when you see mesenteric changes and you start to see what you can hallucinate or imagine as tethered, angulated bowel, remember about the extrinsic diseases that can secondarily affect the small bowel. Suppose there is metastatic disease right to the mesentery and the small bowel happens to be just a bystander that gets angulated, but the last disease, and very commonly, as Abe said, is carcinoid tumor of the small bowel, especially in the terminal ileum. Remember that it has somatostatin receptors on it. It can be diagnosed by an indium-111 octreotide scan, and this actually, it was a carcinoid uh, tumor in the small bowel. So in summary, if you find yourself looking at small bowel follow-throughs for whatever reason, don't dread it. Please avoid the gamut approach. Don't tell your consultant every single thing you know about the small bowel if the pattern doesn't fit the disease. There are only a few number of diseases and make yourself a logical plan. This is a slide borrowed from my friend Joel Lichtenstein at the University of Seattle, and he says, well, he's happy when he gets a small bowel file through exam. He gets to show what he knows, and he gets to help the patient. So with that, I thank you for allowing me to participate. Let's build on the uh, fund of knowledge that we uh, developed when we discussed the had an approach to the upper GI tract and continue that with the lower GI tract. So in the colon, one might uh, look at masses and divide them into mucosal, such as your typical adenoma or adenocarcinoma. We said the most common submucosal lesion in the colon is a lipoma or extrinsic, such as METs, similar to the small bowel features that you just saw, strictures being benign and malignant, such as carcinoma for malignancy. The most common benign strictures would be to, to diverticulitis or inflammatory bowel disease. And the common outpouchings would be common everyday diverticulosis or outpouchings associated with healed inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, so let's start with a normal surface pattern. We certainly see normal haustral markings. There are some things that might be confusing, sometimes in nominate grooves or feature on double contrast in lymphoid follicles when small can be normal, when prominent can be abnormal. This is a double contrast uh, study, which if you've never seen it before, seeing this very, very fine uh, punctate little outpouchings. They look like almost fine ulcers, but you look at it on FOSS, it almost looks like a fine lace tablecloth. Very hard to show in a slide, but if you've never seen it before, it certainly might confuse you for ulcerative colitis. This is a normal, very normal pattern. This is innominate grooves of the colon. You differentiate it from abnormal because of its irregularity. They're the same depth and the same distribution uh, everywhere as opposed to real ulcers that wouldn't be so regular. <coughs> 
Uh, holes in the gut might be ulcers or diverticula. Diverticular characterized by containing muscularis mucosa, which may contract. Therefore, they're more likely to change and show mucosal markings in a semi-collapsed state. The masses will take the same approach, intraluminal, mucosal, irregular acute angles, submucosal, acute angle but smooth, and extrinsic, obtuse angle and smooth. So here are uh, those little bumps or surface features. These are lymphoid follicles, so these bumps would be little raised areas coming off them, typically mucosa, but actually really submucosal. could be mucosal and submucosal in location. And usually a normal variant, there are some reports of prominent follicles around areas of a carcinoma or in association with lymphoproliferative disorders. A raised lesion from the mucosa, uh, a polyp is just a very nondescript term, but once we use the term polyp, although it just means a bump, we typically mean things that originate in the mucosa and consider submucosal a mimic. So just by our common parlance, muco polyp usually means mucosal. Now, the most common would be a hyperplastic polyp, thought to be a degenerating or aging phenomenon of the colon, very common as patients get older. Uh, more of concern would be an adenomatous polyp because of its malignant potential, and then some unusual situations such as hamartomas that we alluded to in the small bowel talk, such as Pitzjager syndrome and various other syndromes, such as generalized juvenile polyposis that can involve the small bowel or post-inflammatory polyps, pseudopolyps. These are terms we'll talk about more in IBD carcinomas. So here's a uh, double contrast view of the lateral wall of the rectum. You can see uh, what's called a bowler hat sign. You can actually make out the base of the polyp as an oval and another rounded cap or head of the polyp, and this is an adenomal in the posterior wall of the rectum. Here you're catching it more perfectly on FOS. It's very thin, a little bit dark. I hope you could see that. And when you turn it off perfect lateral view and catch it obliquely slightly, you get this bowler hat sign. Uh, here in the erect spot film from uh, the proximal descending colon, you can actually show the morphology of this polyp. Uh, certainly when you see a polyp, mention its size, location, morphology. In this case, it is pedunculated. You can make out the pedicle. You can make out the stalk and see what we call a stalactite phenomenon or a little bit of barium caught dripping off the polyp. Might look like a dot when you catch it on FOSS, but here catching it in profile on an erect view are very nicely demonstrated. And that was an adenoma. Uh, this, again, is an unusual finding, a little hard to demonstrate. But the first thing you need to look at is the quality of the coating. See, the quality of the coating is excellent. You know that because you see a continuous white line and profile everywhere and a nice grayness on FOSS. And that beautiful grayness nicely demonstrated here, but in the lateral wall of the rectum is interrupted by a very, very fine irregular pattern. And uh, the first thing to do is assume that that might be bad coding and turn the patient. And if it doesn't go away, that could be a very superficial spreading carcinoma. And that's what that is. That's probably the uh, earliest uh, superficial carcinoma I've, I've ever seen in my career. And um, this is uh, very analogous to the stomach shots I showed you in the previous lecture of a villus tumor. You can see the irregular frond-like appearance of barium entering the interstices of this very nodular tumor. And uh, tumors in the colon can certainly be uh, villus. They can be tubular or mixed. And this is a villus tumor. Less commonly in the stomach, I'm sorry, less commonly in the colon, we can have scirrus carcinomas. Now, scirrus carcinomas are associated with a lot of fibrosis. They can be very long segment. They could possibly mimic benign strictures because you tend to think of an apple core as being very short segment. And this would be the analog of a linatus plastica in the stomach, if you will. In fact, the term linatus plastica of the colon has been applied to these scirrus carcinomas. So you see a very long segment stricture, but no diverticula anywhere, and in fact, the stricture is a little uh, asymmetric and has a very, very abrupt termination and uh, abrupt termination on the proximal and distal ends. You can actually see, if you follow the colon around, that the tumor is growing asymmetrically more on this inner curve on the wall going up to this point where we return to normal mucosa, whereas on the other wall, it's not growing as far down, so you can see the asymmetry. This is an ulcerating carcinoma, a very large rectal lesion causing rectal bleeding. And uh, this very, very large mass, again, has some associated desmoplasia, which is why you're getting some of those radiating folds, by the way, even though this is the rectum and rectosigmoid. And the ulcer is very, very large with contrast hanging up in the niche. Here we see a typical apple core lesion in the transverse colon, acute overhanging edges. So why am I showing another one of those? Because proximal, the bowel is dilated, 
So it's uh, causing a, an incomplete obstruction. And if you look at the mucosa in the dilated bowel proximal to the apple core, you can see a bunch of circles. And those aren't dark enough to be filling defects in stool. Those are real. And that is actually little areas of submucosal edema. That pattern has been called urticaria of the colon. Or the carry of the colon is a misnomer, but that's the term applied to this pattern. It's just basically a little bit of pinky printing or thumb printing due to the submucosal edema due to the chronic dilatation and interference with the blood flow to the vasovasorum and the chronically dilated colon. CT analog of uh, almost an apple core lesion, somewhat asymmetric growth of this uh, semicircumferential lesion on the right wall of the rectum. Actually, some small nodes associated and some prominent blood vessels. CT is not very reliable at diagnosing fat infiltration, but when you see fuzzy fat around the mass, it suggests fatty infiltration. No, this is not a virtual colonoscopy. This was a regular CT scan. The patient just fortuitously happened to have a lot of gas in the colon, and we saw this little plaque-like lesion along the left rectal wall that was not known about prior to the CT, which was not done for a colonic abnormality and actually suggested that the patient be scoped, and that was actually uh, the way this cancer was found. Here's a more typical apple core lesion in the sigmoid colon, acute uh, angles or overhanging edges. So just to show you the CT analog, notice that this serosal surface is smooth, but this serosal surface is lob lobular. In fact, statistically, any time you see an apple core lesion, you're usually dealing with fat infiltration in local nodes, if not distant disease. They're often Duke's D lesions at the time of diagnosis. And just to remind you that the lesions can occur anywhere in the GI tract, certainly right-sided lesions here mark thickening in the region of the cecum and ascending colon with several large local nodes indicating nodal spread for this advanced right-sided cancer. And the right-sided cancers can so often grow circumferentially. They can often grow in a flat-like manner, which is why on barymenemas, even though the colon might look cecum-shaped, you might be looking at a tumor that just emphasizes the need to look for anatomic landmarks, appendix, ileocecal valve, terminal ileum, before you know, can say you did a complete examination. Um, Claire made reference to polyposis syndromes and familial polyposis. Familial polyposis would be a cause of multiple raised lesions. Uh, we'll come back to the slide in a second, but let me just show you this erect spot film showing multiple filling defects of uh, multiple polyps in the patient with familial polyposis carpeting the colon. Now, certainly, if you have it's an unusual entity for most of us in general practice. Some of these patients tend to come to centers that deal with families that are known to have familial polyposis. Uh, but certainly when there's a tendency when you actually come across a case, and I have in my career actually come across a few real cases of familial polyposis, some that were not necessarily diagnosed before, there's this tendency that, oh, that must be stool. I mean, there are so many of these things that must be stool. So just be careful about that. I mean, if you're doing a barium and you see a lot of things, just keep in mind it might be real, and this is a familial polyposis. Certainly those patients get total colectomies because those are adenomas. Adenomas due to the adenoma carcinoma sequence. Most colon cancers exist in pre-existing adenomas, and that certainly is the case, too, in familial polyposis. Although there may be some alleles that give them cancers de novo, probably most of those cancers originate in those adenomas. They can also have small bowel lesions and periampulary cancers. And a slightly variation on the theme, the Gardner's syndrome with bone, dental, and soft tissue abnormalities. This is a patient with Gardner's syndrome. Some think of it as separate. Some think of it as a variation on familial polyposis. The dental abnormalities might include unerupted teeth, something called hypersementomas. You can see several of these hypersementomas and unerupted teeth. They also get caries, and they also get exostoses in several places, both on the axial and the appendicular skeleton, but the angle of the jaw is a common place. So this would be a nice classic example of Gardner's. The patients with Gardner's syndrome have a predisposition to develop fibrous tissue. Uh, African Americans may get prominent keloid formation on the skin. Uh, anyone who has surgery may get prominent adhesions. They're more likely to develop bowel obstruction due to adhesions. And sometimes they can get obstruction due to what's called fibromatosis of the mesentery, which is a rip roaring fibrous reaction, particularly after surgery or unrecognized trauma. And that's what's happening here. Uh, if I showed you this as an unknown, the observation to make is there's no colon. And if I showed you later films, this patient's already had a colectomy. And we see bowel obstruction due to uh, severe long-segment strictures and multifocal disease. Patiager syndrome would be a variation on the theme that Claire also mentioned, and those are actually hamartomas, 50% are autosomal dominant, 50% sporadic, and while they can involve the entire GI tract, 95% involve the small bowel, often with pain, intersusception, and bleeding due to the intersusceptions. And they can get malignancies. This is a... Uh, 
One of the ways you can actually make the diagnosis is if the patient's already there, getting an upper GI, just ask him to say, ah, look inside the mouth. And while freckles are common on the skin, you do not see freckles on buccal mucosa, except, to my knowledge, in patients with put Jaeger syndrome. Canada Cronkite syndrome was also alluded to by Claire as a sporadic entity, and it's the one that tends to occur in older patients. So if somebody shows you something that looks like it should be familial polyposis, but you look at the film and the age of the patient's, you know, 70 years old, and it's probably going to be Canada Cronkite syndrome. These patients usually present 40 to 75 years of age with either a very slow, insidious onset or sometimes a very acute onset of watery diarrhea, blood anorexia, protein loss, and skin and nail uh, changes. Uh, so the single contrast, Barry Menema, multiple car polyps just totally carpeting the colon. They could also carpet the stomach. They could be large and they could be small. Uh, this is a different case of uh, actually multiple polyps, and it's not a polyposis syndrome. This is pseudomembranous colitis, and sometimes pseudomembranes and pseudomembranous colitis form groupings that actually look like polyps and can mimic a polyposis. We certainly don't normally do a Barry Menema in those situations. Um, in this case which uh, came to me uh, through the AFIP, is a uh, patient with um, or the carry of the colon. Again, or the carry of the colon, also called giraffe skin colon. Essentially similar to what I showed you before, except in the classic or the carry of the colon, it takes these polygonal shapes. Why does it take polygonal shapes? It's just a geometric feature of the enlarging submucosal edema. So this is very nonspecific. Same reason, for example, theory. Let's just make an analog to the previous lecture on gallbladder. Why are gallstones facetted? They don't start off facetted, but they're just bumping up against each other, so they become facetted as they grow. Well, submucosal edema starts off round, your classic pinky printing, becoming thumb printing, and if the process continues, those thumb prints then square off against each other. So this was a misnomer. Any cause, 30 different entities, anything that can cause submucosal edema can cause or to carry the colon, so it's just a term that you use when you see this polygonal appearance of the raised lesions. I hear a spot film from a double contrast barium enema showing a smooth mass with an acute angle at the inferior margin, a very vague, difficult, obtuse angle at the top. It's sort of asymmetric the way it's hanging down. And this is a lipoma. So this is a submucosal lesion. Oh, well, could it be something else? Let's speak about it as an unknown. Somebody shows this to you as an unknown. Well, could it be an adenoma? Well, sure, and that it could be an adenoma, but adenomas getting this big would likely have some irregularity. Could it be a carcinoma? I say carcinomas have self-respect. By the time they get this big, they're going to be irregular. So statistically speaking, you see something this big, this shape, it's going to be a submucosal lesion, and the most common submucosal lesion we said in the colon's a lipoma. So you see you can whittle the differential down into a most likely diagnosis. And actually, in this case, even though it's one film, you see how it looks asymmetric because the patient is standing up? It's actually soft. Well, you can't make that definitive observation from one film, but if you had the patient in front of you and you can see change in shape, or apparent change in size by change in position, peristalsis, or compression, there are very few things in the GI tract that are soft enough to actually change shape. Only things that are made out of fat are things that are filled with fluid. So if you could definitively make that observation, it should be something like a duplication cyst or a lipoma, maybe a hematoma or an intramural abscess in some unusual case. Even though people say in the literature hemangiomas might be soft enough to change shape, I've never seen that happen. And certainly, as we showed in previously in the stomach, in the colon as well, you can make a definitive diagnosis of a lipoma by showing that it's made out of fat here, negative 133 Hansfield units. And what about this uh, lesion? A kind of long segment, looks a little bit like an apple core. Here it's kind of tapered. Here it's kind of acute. It's fairly long segment. You might be thinking about maybe it's a scurrus carcinoma, like I showed you before in the sigmoid. But most of you probably have made the observation that there are a bunch of calcifications here, very reminiscent of phlebolis. So phlebolis in an unusual location or in association with a mass is enough to allow you to make a diagnosis of a mangioma. That could be a very important diagnosis to make. Even though this is an uncommon entity, there are certain cases in the literature that have certainly been the source of uh, medical legal issues of somebody biopsies a mangioma and the patient then bleeds. There are reports like that where a patient will bleed to death because somebody assumed it was a carcinoma, went in, did an endoscopy. And then you go back and you look at the films and the radiologist missed the phlebolith. And it could be just one phlebolith. But if that phlebolith is an unusual location and associated with the mass, that's enough for you to make a specific diagnosis. So I think it's very important to know about it, even if you come across one of these in your career. Um, here's a, a long segment lesion of a very rigid rectum and rectosigmoid, very scalloped. If you see that and the patient has 
No history of trauma, radiation. I mean, this should be a cancer. And the problem here is this is a hemangioma, and there, and there are a flebolus, but flebolus are commonly seen in the pelvis. So, you know, you can't necessarily make that diagnosis. Interestingly, these patients often have a history of bleeding and anemia that's been very chronic, sometimes going on, not properly worked up for many, many years. Uh, the other, I mean, just before I talk about the next entity, I actually want to emphasize this, that you might think that the endoscopist would go in and see, oh, it's obviously hemangioma. Red just looks like a hemangioma or a bluish or purplish hue. And these hemangiomas are chronic. They undergo fibrosis. And therefore, many parts of the lesion on the mucosal side actually look whitish due to the fibrosis. It's not always obvious to the endoscopist they're dealing with a hemangioma. Uh, another entity, endometriosis. GI involvement is common, uh, about 12% in one large series. And the most common location is rectosigmoid. It can spread by intraperitoneal spread or by hematogenous spread. certainly been reported in a variety of locations, including the chest. Um, and so uh, it de depends where. The most common location would be the uh, rectosigmoid because it's a dependent portion and the natural flow of intraperitoneal fluid would allow metastases as well as endometriosis, as well as abscesses to occur in that location. So this would be your Rentgen classic. The anterior wall of the rectosigmoid right around the peritoneal reflection where you see what looks like either an extrinsic or a submucosal mass. This pleated pattern is common. It's been called in double contrast literature the crenulated pattern. Not specific for endometriosis, but really anything that implants on the serosal surface of the bowel, be it endometriosis, metastatic disease, can look like that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about IBD and do a little bit of correlation between some of the barium and some of the cross-sectional imaging findings. With ulcerative colitis, you want to think about studying both the acute and the chronic phase. In the acute phase, depending on how early the disease is, the way to remember this and think about it is from early disease to late disease. So in very early disease, you might require a double contrast study just as a very subtle granularity. Those are really little crypts or microabscesses. And as those microabscesses coalesce and get bigger, then they become big enough to pool little pieces of barium and actually give mucosal stippling. And then the ulcers can certainly get deep and give you collar button ulcers. You can also see hastral thickening or loss because you can have acute disease superimposed on chronic disease. And then inflammatory polyps with active inflammation. The disease should progress from the rectum proximally in a confluent contiguous circumferential fashion and not skip areas. Um, here is uh, small little stippled ulcers on the background of granularity. The very earliest findings of subtle granularity are almost impossible to show on the slide. So I would say this would be sort of the second level of disease where you actually see mucosal stippling or very, very small shallow ulcers. Uh, this would be an example of those collar button ulcers. Notice that the disease has already caused loss of haustration. The disease is confluent, although I'm not showing you the rectum. There's no skip areas. It's going from the rectum, progressing backwards. And by the way, quite interestingly, where the disease is, involves the bowel, stool doesn't stick because you have inflammation and you have a lot of mucus. You can actually predict before you do a barium enema by looking at the scout film where the disease begins and ends. Where you start seeing stool is usually where the colon turns to normal. And these collar button ulcers are not absolutely pathognomonic of ulcerative colitis. They certainly can occur in any severe infectious colitis, but UC would be the most common cause. And when you have diffuse ulceration, you can have residual islands of mucosa. This is residual islands of red, beefy, and flame mucosa. This is the proper picture to remember in your mind for the term pseudopolyps, a post pseudopolyps. So pseudopolyposis, properly termed, means residual islands of mucosa with denuded mucosa around it. Now, if that mucosa has active disease, you can actually also call it an inflammatory polyp. But I want to differentiate that from inactive disease. So this would be an old single contrast barium enema showing these actually goes with the same case. This is this case. And again, we certainly should not be doing barium enemas in these patients and generally would not be anymore. And certainly anybody that has gross bleeding, peritoneal signs, or severe acute abdominal symptoms, you should not be doing anything to raise the intraluminal pressure of the colon and risk perforation. Um, this would be the classic pipe stem colon, burnt out ulcerative colitis. It involves the entire colon from rectum to cecum. It becomes a patulous ileocecal valve with gross reflux into the small bowel, and you can't see any haustration. 
Um, is there a differential diagnosis? Well, if you see a similar pattern, but it's limited to the right colon, then it really shouldn't be ulcerative colitis, because ulcerative colitis goes from rectum to cecum. That can occur in an entity called cathartic colon, patients who abuse cathartics. You'll have a pipe stem colon, but it involves the right colon with sparing of the left colon. Whereas in UC, you'll see the entire colon involved, typically. Now, what about post-inflammatory polyps? The proper term post-inflammatory polyps really refers to a host of histologic entities, the most common being hyperplasia or hyperplastic polyps, meaning a reaction of the mucosa, you get proliferation of the mucosa, and that's a hyperplastic polyp. So the most common post-inflammatory polyp is a hyperplastic polyp. Now, the shape of that hyperplastic polyp is often thin, gracile, and branching. That's the term filiform. So filiform branching polyps refers to the gross morphologic feature. Hyperplastic refers to the histology. But in fact, if you look, and there was one very nice article that showed this, uh, at all the histologies across the board of patients with burnt-out inflammatory bowel disease, there are other histologies. You can get small polyps through the lymphoid aggregates. You can get large polyps through the mucus retention cysts and granulation tissue forming small and medium-sized polyps, a half to 1.5 cm. So this is your classic post-inflammatory polyps, filiform polyps. I show you a non-magnified view, so you can see the extent of this, both in contour and single contrast and on FOS, in the double contrast portions of the transverse colon and a little bit here in the cecum, uh, branching thin polyps. Now, sometimes, and this patient has ulcerative colitis, you can see polyps that form a little bit more irregular shape. Uh, sometimes the mucosa and contour is taking a little bit of an irregular feature. There is nothing specific about this, but when you see this developing, you certainly need to be concerned if you see a very granular or reticular pattern in somebody who has no active disease that they're developing dysplasia or carcinoma, which is obviously a risk for these patients with chronic ulcerative colitis. Barium has no role in making the diagnosis. These patients should really uh, be having uh, endoscopies. But the point here is that if you do do a barium enema on these patients and you see an area with a reticular abnormality, you can direct the endoscopist to that, to that location. Because very often what they're doing is they're just scoping these patients routinely and doing random biopsies throughout the disease portions of the colon to find dis areas of dysplasia and cancer. So you can help direct the biopsy. And this is a patient who developed a carcinoma, ulcerative colitis, with an area of stricturing. There's no way to be specific whether this is a benign or a malignant stricture of ulcerative colitis, but this, in fact, was a cancer. Now, on CT, in addition to those findings, I'd like to just show you one other finding called mural stratification. It's a target or a halo sign, and you see enhancing mucosa and muscularis propria, which might be edematous, fixed submucosa, and there may be fat deposition. In fact, most of the hypodensity in the, in the uh, submucosa is thought to be fat due to fat deposition. I'll come back to this slide, but let me just progress to the next one just to show you what I mean. So here's a relatively collapsed transverse colon. You can see the enhancing mucosa, and see how hypodense and that submucosa looks. That's just very prominent submucosal fat. That's called mural stratification. Now let's go back. Now, that is seen most commonly in patients with burnt out ulcerative colitis. In fact, over half of the patients. It's not pathognomonic. It can be seen in a small percentage of patients with Crohn's disease or, in fact, burnt out colitis due to infection, pseudomembranous colitis, ischemia, radiation, and even in graft versus host disease. Now, this is the same patient just a few cuts lower down, and you can see that you still see a little bit of that submucosal lucency, but notice how right over here that submucosal lucency is interrupted by a thick soft tissue density and a big node. So this is actually the ability to make a CT diagnosis by interruption of the mural stratification that this patient with UC has now developed a carcinoma, and in fact that was the case. So that area was then scoped, biopsied, and proved to be a carcinoma. In Crohn's disease, now let's switch to Crohn's disease and do a little review of that. The disease is transmural, characterized by skip lesions and mesenteric disease. Look for fistulas, abscesses, creeping fat, fibro fatty change, wall thickening. Uh, it's certainly a little bit more homogeneous than you see. You tend not to see the stratification and, of course, look for terminal ileum or small bowel involvement. And some of the things that Claire has again shown in the small bowel talk. Uh, just some examples. Here is a patient with... Uh, double contrast barium enema study, and you can actually see some linear, shallow ulcerations, a little bit similar to the aphthous ulcers I showed you in the stomach, but in this case, instead of being round, they're a little bit cigar-shaped and linear. And notice how the more you look, the more you see. They can be quite subtle. 
And this patient with uh, Crohn's disease developed a fistulous communication here between the colon and the small bowel. Very hard on a contrast study like this to tell if that's large bowel disease extending to involve the small bowel, a small bowel disease extending to involve the large bowel, or a combination thereof. And here's some mass effect due to the fibro fatty change in the mesentery. This patient has burnt out, or inactive, I should say, um, Crohn's disease, but had severe involvement involving the right colon. And this is a pattern of a, what's often termed pseudosaculation. It's not a great term, but it's entrenched in the literature and in our radiology jargon. So when you see a patient with Crohn's disease, no active disease, and has these multiple outpouchings, the, really, the areas of the outpouching are the spared normal mucosa. And what it was is you had involvement of the mucosa around it and scarring, so the normal areas that are spare are then left to pouch out. And that gives this appearance. So you may just see one or two or three. This is kind of a dramatic case with a lot of them throughout the whole right colon and transverse colon. And uh, this patient with an annular stricture, and in the area of the annular stricture, you can actually make out multiple filling defects that look very, very round, tubular, and some finger-like. So this is a stricture in Crohn's disease, and in the area of stricturing, you have hyperplastic polyp formation. There was no malignancy here, actually. Okay, now what about a patient like this? We see barium enema, and we see diverticulosis, and we see extravasation of contrast, suggestive of diverticulitis and an abscess formation. So um, it certainly always is differential. Knowing the history may help, but this, uh, this is switching gears to... Uh, to uh, diverticulitis, and um, reminding you that diverticulitis can be a right-sided disease, and you can have abscess formation uh, and perforation that can be evident on CT. Uh, the staging of diverticulitis is not something you do every day in your report, but basically it's what you do when you think about the case. And basically the role of CT is really to decide whether the patient has an abscess and how that abscess should be managed. So you're basically looking to see, is the abscess mature, is it not mature, is it amenable to percutaneous uh, a catheter placement, or does this patient possibly require surgery? And so this scheme is sort of something that you might think about, even though you may not report it by stages. So, for example, let's take a look at some of the complications and some other examples in diverticulitis. Here, distorted sigmoid colon, multiple diverticula. There's a little bit of contrast, extravasating out, so there's actually an active perforation. Certainly, uh, most of these patients now would not be getting barium enemas. We're usually doing barium enemas sometimes to evaluate the chronic disease uh, or if the, barrier, if the endoscopist encounters a stricture and can't complete their colonoscopy, the classic way of evaluating the remainder of the colon is through a barium enema, although now we have alternate ways such as virtual colonoscopy. If you do see extravasation of contrast, it's important to recognize it. I can't tell you how many cases I've seen where uh, a fluoroscopist did not recognize extra, uh, extraluminal contrast and uh, continued to instill contrast. And in the colon, that's very bad because you're instilling stool and infected matter into the peritoneal cavity, which could be a source of death. Uh, here on CT, we see that this is the top of the sigmoid colon, and although you don't see the diverticula, this is diverticulitis, and there's actually inflammation, and where's that inflammation going? The inflammation is actually going retroperitoneally. Notice how it's in right in front of the iliopsoas muscle. Here's contrast in the ureter. You can see the inflammatory change in fluid and stranding partially encasing the ureter. So, you know, sometimes we sort of glibly make fun of the uh, ER docs, and they send us fishing expeditions and CT rule out appendicitis, and it turns out to be diverticulitis or Crohn's. This is a very nice example of why you might get red, red cells and even some white cells in the urine in a patient with Crohn's disease. So think about GU involvement to the GI disease processes. And uh, here's a similar concept. I mean, if I show this to you as an unknown, this is the colon, this is the small bowel. The wall of the small bowel is thickened, and there's clearly soft tissue and fluid and inflammatory process extending from the colon to the small bowel. Well, is this colonic disease extending to the small bowel or small bowel disease extending to the colon? You'd have to give a differential. You'd have to include diff diverticulitis extending to involve the small bowel or Crohn's disease of either the small bowel or large bowel, and this was diverticulitis. Again, history may help you in looking for disease elsewhere. As you know, more burnt out, diverticulitis can form your classic benign stricture in the colon. One of the clues here, by the way, is that you see diverticula in the stricture. 
I don't know that I want to hang my hat on it medical legally. I have absolute 100% certainty. But, you know, if you see ticks through a stricture, you're having trouble telling, is this an apple core, is this a cancer, is this a benign stricture? Uh, just remember Abe's rule. Cancer has self-respect. So if, if you're looking at mucosal disease, it's going to destroy the mucosa. You're not going to see diverticulosis smack in the middle of a cancer. As long as you're sure it's a classic tick with a neck and it's mucosa and not an ulceration. And here's right sided diverticulitis, little extravasation or extraluminal contrast. Really should reserve the term extravasation to angiography. Um, but just to remind you that diverticulitis can be right sided, a little more common, and to, sometimes to see younger women with involvement of diverticulitis and diverticulosis in the right colon. And as I mentioned, the role of CT is to look and see if there is an abscess, see how mature that abscess is. Here we see in the dependent portion of the colon an abscess with some uh, wall developing some maturity due to diverticulitis coming from that abnormal sigmoid colon that also has diverticulosis elsewhere, wall thickening, and clearly an abscess. So, uh, an unusual, but sometimes one of these Röntgen classics, sometimes you see on a quiz panel, somebody might show you a plain film with a big hot air balloon appearing gas structure, and this is a complication of diverticulitis. This is called giant sigmoid diverticulum. So here we see diverticulosis, this long neck, and this diverticulum-like structure that's very, very big for an everyday diverticulum. And they can get even bigger. They can be quite huge. Uh, the, the theory is that this is diverticulitis with a little abscess cavity that continues to communicate with the GI tract, with the colon, and therefore host defense mechanisms prevent this from becoming an abscess, or it basically drains itself into the colon, heals, and develops a fibrous wall. So the patient clinically gets better, but what happens is every time the patient strains its stool, the, the wall of that fibrous wall stretches, gets bigger, heals, stretches, heals, stretches, and that's why you can possibly see this. Now, even though it's called giant sigmoid diverticulum, again, it can occur anywhere. I've seen it occur in the transverse and right colon. Okay, so we use the pattern approach to review a bunch of cases and entities in the giant large bowel, similar to the small bowel. I hope that was very helpful to you. Thank you very much for your attention.